Dead America, The El Paso Invasion. Dead America, The First Week, Book 5. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 3. 9.13 a.m. Homicide Detective Rogers leaned his head back against the headrest of his 1970 Boss 302 Mustang, running a hand over the steering wheel lovingly. He'd taken pride in his efforts to rebuild his first vehicle, spending years tracking down original parts and wanting it to be as authentic as possible. His eyes fluttered closed with images of the jet-black car rolling through his head, but perked up immediately at the sound of a sharp whistle. Now I know you're not trying to take a nap, are you? Detective Brad Stevenson bellowed as he approached the car. He held up a tray of coffee and breakfast tacos, looking almost ridiculous, standing next to the car with his five-foot-two powder keg frame. Just trying to squeeze in what I can when I can, Rogers replied. The last 24 hours have been nuts. Stevenson nodded. That's an understatement, he agreed and then skirted the car. He plonked himself into the passenger seat and passed over the large paper cup and tilted the tray to display the two tacos. Sausage or bacon? Bacon's good for the heart, right? Rogers asked, patting his chest through the plain polo shirt he donned. His partner cocked his head. You're a southern boy, aren't you? Born and bred. Then yeah, it is, Stevenson replied with a chuckle. Sorry, I couldn't find any gravy for you. Rogers plucked the bacon taco with a grin. Gonna have to write you up then. They bit into their breakfast and surveyed the parking lot. The entire area had been cordoned off to be used as a staging area for the police. Several dozen police officers were moving about, collecting food and ammo, some of them getting emergency medical treatment. Some took power naps on makeshift cots in an erected tent. There were shotgun-wielding guards every 20 feet, keeping an eye on the city that devolved into chaos around them. The dose of reality sobered the two detectives in a quick nosedive. Still can't believe this shit is real, Stevenson said quietly. Rogers took a sip of his brew. You mean the zombies or the cartel finally invading us? I may be young, but I've been working homicide with you long enough to know we were invaded a long time ago. His partner replied with a roll of his eyes. Rogers barked a laugh. That's true. Still amazed at how brazen they've become, though. Makes you wonder just how fucked we are. Well, the military's doing bombing runs in Austin and San Antonio, so I'd wager we are somewhere between super-duper and mega-fucked, Stevenson mused. His partner swallowed a particularly large mouthful of taco and cleared his throat, scratching the thinning black hair on the back of his head. You heard any estimates on how many of them flooded over the border yesterday? Too fucking many, man. Stevenson shook his head. I haven't heard from anybody I trust, but a couple of guys in the breakfast line were talking about it. They were swearing up and down that 15,000 armed cartel members came in. Rogers let out an exasperated guffaw. Oh, is that all? We're only outnumbered 15 to 1. Look at the bright side, his partner pointed out. 15 to 1 is a better ratio than the 500 to 1 we're getting with the zombies. I knew I liked you for a reason. Rogers wagged a greasy finger at his passenger. Always looking on the bright side of life. The police radio on the dash let out a squeal. Emergency SWAT backup is being requested at the East Side Mercy Hospital, a female dispatch operator demanded. Heavily armed assailants have taken control of the building and are holding an unknown number of hostages. SWAT, please respond with ETA. The two officers continued their breakfast, chewing the last bites of their tacos. SWAT, emergency assistance needed at the East Side Mercy Hospital. The dispatch tried again. Please respond with ETA. Another 20 seconds passed, and there was radio silence. Rogers looked over to his partner and shrugged his muscular shoulders. What do you think? He asked. Stevenson licked his fingers clean and wiped them on his jeans. I'm all for going to save some beautiful nurses. I sincerely hope that's because you like a woman in uniform and not because of some debaucherous fetish you discovered on the dark side of the internet. 
Rogers turned the key in the ignition, and the Mustang roared to life. Stevenson put up a hand. Hey now, don't kink shame. Some of us are just more enlightened about the finer things in life. His partner shook his head, cracking a half smile as he picked up the receiver to respond. SWAT, do you copy? The dispatch asked once more. Rogers clicked the button. Dispatch, this is Detectives Rogers and Stevenson. I don't believe SWAT is taking your call at the moment. We're in the neighborhood and we'll provide backup. Detective Rogers, that is a negative. The woman replied immediately. They are requesting SWAT, not homicide. Very well, dispatch. He replied with a shrug. Question, though. Have the assailants killed anyone on sight? There was a pause and then a click. Yes, numerous fatalities have been reported. Okay, then, Rogers said to her with a large smile on his face. Dispatch, this is Detectives Rogers and Stevenson of Homicide. We are moving out to the East Side Mercy Hospital to investigate a mass murder event. If you need us, that's where we'll be. The woman sighed heavily through the speaker, and Stevenson snorted a laugh. Very well, Detective, she said begrudgingly. Just make sure you bring some big guns with you. Rogers snickered before pushing the button again. Dispatch, I am deeply hurt and offended at your implication that I am not heavily armed. May I remind you that I am, in fact, a native-born Texan? Just be safe, detective, she snapped. He saluted the radio. 10-4, dispatch. He devoured the last bite of his taco and tossed the wrapper out the open window. He revved the engine, and Stevenson immediately chugged his hot coffee in its entirety, squeaking and waving air into his open mouth in an attempt to cool it off. Rogers raised a confused eyebrow. You know it's a ten-minute drive, right? I've seen you drive, his partner retorted. It's not exactly conducive to beverage drinking. Caffeine is more important at the moment than preventing mouth burns. Rogers chuckled. Point taken. He popped the car into gear and hit the gas, burning out the tires and sending white smoke into the air. He peeled out of the driveway and down the nearly vacant street towards the hospital. Chapter 2 Rogers pulled around the last corner before the hospital and slowly rumbled behind a row of trees about 50 yards from the action. There were four police cars parked in front of the four-story hospital building, facing the large glass entranceway. Six officers ducked behind their cars, occasionally popping up to fire a few shots, but retreating as soon as automatic gunfire ripped into their cars in reply. Rogers shook his head as one of the foolishly brave officers began to creep around the car and took a few rounds to the chest. His vest saved his life, but he groaned on the ground, likely wishing for death from the hard impact. We should probably get loaded up here, Rogers suggested. His partner nodded, and they exited the car in unison, heading around to the trunk. Rogers popped it open, revealing a small arsenal of weaponry. Stevenson eagerly dove in, picking up an AK-47 and a handful of extra mags. His partner opted for a scoped AR-15. Stevenson raised an eyebrow. What, no grenades? Eh, they were on back order, Rogers replied. The duo chuckled as he closed the trunk, and they moved up to the trees to survey the situation. The battle was a rhythmic back and forth, each side firing for a good ten seconds before switching it up. All right, next time our boys pop up, we run for it, Rogers said. Stevenson wrinkled his nose. Can't believe I'm going to get shot because you didn't want to risk your car. You'll heal, his partner shot back. It won't. Stevenson rolled his eyes, sarcasm evident in his voice as he said, Can't debate sound logic like that. They kept a close eye on the battlefield, and as soon as an officer popped up to fire, they took off running full tilt. They rushed across the open space as their comrades unknowingly laid down cover fire. Unfortunately, a few of the cartel on the second floor noticed reinforcements coming in and opened fire on the two detectives. Stevenson shot back, hitting nothing but bricks, but forcing their assailants to take cover and stop attacking. 
The short burst gave them just enough time to slide into safety behind one of the cars. They ducked behind an overweight uniformed officer, hiding behind his back bumper. He fiddled with his shotgun, attempting to reload it. Who the hell are you guys? He rasped, hands trembling as he struggled to put another shell in his weapon. Detectives Rogers and Stevenson, homicide, Rogers replied. We're your backup. Homicide? The officer cried, eyes widening. We called for SWAT. Well, you got the next best thing, Rogers snapped. So you want to give us the lowdown on the situation? Or do you want us to take off since you so clearly have things well in hand? The frightened officer pursed his lips and then ducked down even further as a bullet ricocheted off the roof of his car. All right, all right, he gasped. About 30 minutes ago, we had a report of shots fired in the hospital. My partner and I responded and immediately took fire. We've been in a standoff ever since. Any idea how many are in there? Stevenson asked. He shook his head. We've been able to confirm 10 shooters on the first and second floor, with most of them being on the first, but... But what, man? Rogers raised his eyebrows in anticipation. Spit it out. But, the officer stammered and scrubbed a hand down his red face. We've heard lots of other gunfire coming from inside the building, and it's slowly been moving up. You have officers around any other part of the building? Rogers asked. No, sir. He shook his head violently from side to side. We checked the other entrances, but they're locked down tighter than the front. After that sweep, we pulled back to here. Rogers turned to his partner. Lips pressed into a thin line. We need to get in there now. What you got in mind? Stevenson asked. Rogers peeked around the edge of the patrol car, ducking back when the asphalt exploded in a spray of bullets in front of him. Officer, where are the shooters located? Best I've been able to tell, there's four on the right side, three on the left, and three on the second floor, the uniformed man replied. Rogers cocked his head at his partner. You want to go for a ride? Stevenson's eyes widened. No, I really don't. That's the spirit, his partner exclaimed. Officer, we're going to need to borrow your car. Wait, what? The fat officer's chin jiggled as he gaped. What about your car? Stevenson patted him on the shoulder. Trust me, man, that's a battle you aren't going to win. The two detectives got into position and awaited the next volley of fire from the uniformed officers. As soon as the first one popped up, they quickly hopped into the patrol car. Rogers fired up the engine, while Stevenson took up the back seat, laying as low as he could. As Rogers dropped the car into drive and hit the accelerator, bullets pierced the front windshield, narrowly missing his face. The vehicle sped forward on a direct collision course with the glass front of the building, and Rogers ducked down, keeping his foot pinned to the accelerator. The car slammed into a gunman that attempted to thwart them by shooting the invisible driver, crushing him into the reception desk as glass flew everywhere. The detective duo quickly bolted from the car, taking cover behind the wheel wells as a few gunmen went on the offensive after avoiding the shattered glass explosion. The moment the enemies paused to reload, Rogers and Stevenson leapt forward, barreling through the door into the ambulatory care waiting room. They surprised a trio of killers firing out the windows, and the detectives immediately opened fire, striking one of them in the chest. The other two dove behind cover as the detectives skidded behind the reception counter. Paper and computer fragments smashed against the wall above them as the cartel members fired. Cover me, Rogers hissed inclining his head to the reception door. Stevenson nodded, and during a lull in the action, popped up to send a volley of bullets, allowing his partner an opening to sprint hard left and using the reception area to rush to the far end of the building under cover. He took a knee by the final reception window and peered out, seeing the two cartel members firing on Stevenson from behind cover of a row of seats. As soon as they ducked, he hopped over the counter and ran along the wall, sliding into a kneeling position and firing on the two unsuspecting triggermen. As their bodies hit the cream tile, blood pooling beneath them, 
two more gunmen entered the room from the front entrance. They opened fire immediately, forcing him to flatten himself behind the row of chairs. Missed me, motherfuckers, he screamed as they paused to reload, barking at each other in Spanish. They split up and moved through the room. Once they got past the counter, Stevenson ducked behind. He popped up and dispatched both of the enemies with four quick trigger pulls. Roger's clear, he called, and his partner hopped up, making his way across the waiting room, gun aimed at the door the whole way. Is that everybody on the first floor? He asked. Roger shrugged. One can only hope. They both startled as the front door flung open, nearly opening fire until they realized it was the overweight traffic cop from outside. He staggered back into the wall at the sight of the two weapons aimed at his face. Holy hell, boys, don't scare me like that, he cried, tripping right back onto his ass. The detectives headed over and each took a hand, helping the rotund officer up from the ground. Sorry about that, officer, Rogers said. But as you can tell, we weren't too fond of the last people to come through that door. He motioned to the bodies behind them, and all of the blood left the officer's face. He dry heaved before turning away and leaning on the wall, breathing hard. You all right there, man? Stevenson asked, patting him on the back. He held up his hand and nodded, wandering back to the main entrance. The rest of his crew bustled in, with a few injured cartel members in handcuffs. How we looking, gents? Rogers asked. The arresting officer squared his shoulders. We have the first floor secure, sir, and best we can tell, the shooters on the second floor have fled out the back. A few gunshots echoed faintly in the distance, coming from well above where they were. The detectives looked at each other and nodded. Elevators? Rogers asked. The round officer took a deep breath and pointed to the hallway towards the back. Down that hall. The duo jogged down the hallway, hitting the elevators and punching the up button. Top floor and work our way down? Rogers asked. Stevenson nodded as they got into the small space. Works for me. He punched the fourth floor button, and they both reloaded on the way up, checking their weapons. They stood at the ready and aimed as the elevator gave its ding and the doors slid open. A surprised cartel gunman stood in the hallway, fumbling his weapon at the sight of the two armed men. It was enough of an opening for the detectives to fire, sending his body flying against the wall behind him. Roger stepped out of the elevator first, and then hastily retreated as automatic gunfire narrowly missed his nose. That was closer than I would like to admit. Stevenson slowly peeked around the corner, spotting a lone gunman at the end of the hallway, about 15 yards away. He stood in the middle of it, taking no cover, but he had a keen eye, spotting Stevenson and opening fire, forcing him back inside as well. One asshole, end of the hallway, he said. Rogers nodded. All right, I got him. He laid down on the floor and then readied his weapon before kicking off the back wall to slide into the hallway. The cartel gunman fired wildly at head height as soon as he saw movement, but a single squeeze of Roger's gun landed a shot in the middle of the man's chest, dropping him to the floor. Clear. Stevenson bolted out of the elevator, gun raised to provide cover as his partner pulled himself up. There was another gunshot from the room at the end of the hall, and they each hugged one side of the corridor as they skulked towards it. As they approached the final door, a cartel member emerged, assault rifle in hand. Drop the gun, Rogers yelled. Drop it now or we drop you. The bald gunman turned his head towards them, then the rest of his body. His clothes were completely crimson, his face a mural of blood and wild eyes. Go ahead, gringo, arrest me, he drawled and dropped his gun. He held his wrists out to them. You can't stop our work. The detectives paused. I'll cover, you cuff him, Rogers finally said. Stevenson set his weapon down and moved towards the enemy, deftly handcuffing his wrists together. He's secure, he declared. Rogers didn't reply, his brow furrowed at the sight of the patient in the bed behind him, a bullet hole right in their forehead. He glanced across the hall and saw yet another patient, the top of their head missing. Rogers, you all right? Stevenson asked. His partner began to shake when he saw the body of a young girl, 
a similar bullet wound having ended her life. He clenched his fists as he turned towards their prisoner. Just tell me why. Why would you shoot a little girl in the head? Because unlike you Americans, I have balls. The man raised his chin, sneering. I do what needs to be done. We are doing what needs to be done. Really? Rogers asked, tone cool and clipped. You don't think Americans are doing what needs to be done? The dead are rising up against us, and you still care for them like they have the flu. The cartel members spat. You see a little girl in that room. I see her for the monster that she is about to become. How did you know she had the virus? Rogers demanded. Did you check her chart first? I mean, you don't really strike me as the medical type, so not sure you'd be able to tell one way or the other. Their captive laughed. You Americans are so weak-willed. The world is changing around you, and yet you refuse to evolve. It's why you handcuffed me instead of killing me. Rogers raised an eyebrow. You are absolutely correct. We are in a whole new world now, and we need to adjust accordingly. So please, allow me to be the first American to evolve. He smiled, whipped out his handgun, and pulled the trigger. The man only had a fraction of a second to recoil in horror before his brains coated the wall behind him. Stevenson clucked his tongue. Well, that escalated quickly. Sorry, did I get brains on you? Rogers asked. Oh, no, nah, you're good. His partner replied with a noncommittal wave of his hand. Might need to find a water fountain to rinse off my cuffs, though. There was a crashing sound, and the two detectives swiveled around quickly, raising their weapons. They stalked to a large supply closet, and Stevenson flung the door open, Rogers darting in with his gun ready. A dozen doctors and nurses huddled together on the floor, shrieks for their lives erupting from the group. The duo quickly lowered their weapons. Easy now, Rogers cooed. Y'all are safe. One of the nurses leapt up, and hugged Stevenson, bawling into the crook of his neck. He raised an eyebrow to Rogers, who rolled his eyes. They cleared the room and got to the elevator, packing it full and sending it down before waiting for the next car. So, Doc, what happened? Rogers asked one of the doctors that stayed behind. The slender young man shivered. We heard the gunfire coming from the lower floors. I ordered the nurses to close off all the patient doors and take refuge in the supply closet where you found us. I, along with another doctor, stayed out to confront the men when they came up. Looks like they killed everyone else, Stevenson commented. How did you manage to survive? They only wanted the sick people, the doctor replied, swallowing hard. We tried to tell them that everyone who was showing symptoms of the, ahem, zombie virus were on the second floor in quarantine. It fell on deaf ears. One man pushed us to the side and said they couldn't take the chance said it would be like letting a sick cow back into the herd. One mistake and it would end us all. The elevator gave its ding and opened. The trio got inside in silence, each wondering what kind of carnage these cartel members were doing to the rest of the city they were trying to cleanse. Chapter Three The detective duo reloaded their guns as they crossed the hospital parking lot heading towards the tree line where Roger's car hid. Stevenson paused, lifting the sleeve of his shirt. You're springing for the dry cleaning, right? His partner wrinkled his nose as he inspected the tiny piece of brain on the fabric. Oh, come on now, it's not that bad. He waved a hand noncommittally. Tell you what, we'll swing by the dollar store and I'll pick you up some detergent and a scrub brush. Hell, I'll even spring for a diet cola. Whoa now, don't go breaking the bank there. Stevenson replied, eyes wide with sarcasm. Roger shrugged. We work the same job, you know how much I make. Point taken, Stevenson admitted. Detectives, the round officer from before cried. Detectives! The duo stopped and turned, watching him waddle up to them, wheezing with the effort. You all right there, officer? Stevenson asked, eyebrow rising. He leaned his hands on his knees for a moment and then nodded. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. What can we do for you? Rogers asked. The officer straightened up, chest still heaving. Well, you kind of destroyed my car, so I was hoping you could give me a lift back to the station. Depends, Rogers replied, cocking his head in thought. You going to put that in the report? The officer paused and then spread his arms, palms up. 
I'll blame it on the cartel. All right, hop in then, the detective replied with a grin. They headed back to his car and got situated before Rogers peeled out of the laneway where they'd been parked. As they drove through the city, there were signs of struggles and confrontations everywhere. Overturned cars, dumpsters riddled with bullet holes, windows smashed, doors hanging open. The scars of battle were evident. This town is getting ripped a new one, ain't it? Rogers asked. The officer shook his head. This is nothing compared to the other side of the border. Oh, come on, officer, Stevenson replied. Don't tell me you're buying into the rumors. They aren't rumors, detective. The rotund man leaned forward from the back seat. In fact, the stories I've heard from the officers here are understating things. A good buddy of mine is on the force over there. We chatted just before the cartel came crashing across the border. The only word he could come up with was genocide. Stevenson's mouth dropped open. Jesus, he breathed. You sure that wasn't just a translation error on your part? You tell me, detective, the officer replied gravely, pulling up some picture on his phone and handing it over to the passenger's seat. Stevenson flipped through the gallery, each photo more gruesome than the last. Bodies piled eight high in the street, hundreds of corpses strewn across blocks and blocks of city. He said the cartel has a zero-tolerance policy. The officer continued. They went door to door, and if someone so much as sneezed in their presence, they got a bullet to the head. If the family protested, they got a bullet too. And what, your buddy was the cartel photographer? Stevenson snapped, handing the phone back. Why didn't the police step up? My guess is that the cartel owns the police down there. Rogers piped up or own enough of them to make any sort of resistance futile. Quite right, detective, the officer replied, nodding his head emphatically. He kept his head down, which was all he could really do. Stevenson took a deep breath. He's still alive? As far as I know, the officer replied. There was a sudden burst of gunfire nearby, and Rogers slammed on the brakes, sending everyone lurching forward against their seatbelts. The trio scanned the intersection, watching half a dozen zombies run towards a makeshift barricade in front of a store. One by one, the creatures dropped, and as the firing wound down, the gunmen stepped into view. They were bald, heavily tattooed cartel members. The rotund officer struggled with his holster, and once he freed his handgun, he fidgeted, waiting for the go-ahead to take on the gunmen. Rogers raised a hand to signal him to stand down. What are you waiting for? The officer cried. Let's go get them. Hang on, Rogers said firmly. They see us, but they haven't opened fire. One of the bald men made eye contact with the detective and then gave a thumbs up and waved them through the intersection. Well, Stevenson balked. That's a new one. Yeah, I'm curious about that, Rogers agreed. Not curious enough to go talk to them, however. His partner nodded. We should probably get to the station. Maybe they know what's going on. Agreed, Rogers said, and punched the accelerator. The sulking officer in the back seat reluctantly holstered his handgun, leaning back against the headrest in defeat. As the car passed through the remaining few blocks to the police station, they passed several more makeshift barricades manned by cartel members. As they passed each one, several of the gunmen gave rather friendly nods in the car's direction. Rogers chewed his bottom lip in thought. What was going on? Chapter Four Thanks for the lift, guys, the officer blurted as soon as they walked into the chaotic police station. Good luck. Thanks, officer, you too, Stevenson said as their passenger ambled off into the throng of people rushing about. Bodies moved weapons and supplies around, stalking and restocking. One of the nearby desks housed a uniformed officer yelling into three different phones before breaking down into a massive coughing fit. His eyes were completely bloodshot, and he was as sweaty as an obese man going back for sixth at a buffet. When he dropped the phones and collapsed onto his desk, two uniformed officers wandered over and helped him to his feet before escorting him to the back. Is it just me, or are things getting worse by the minute? Stevenson asked as they set him down in the quarantine area. Rogers opened his mouth to answer, 
but a female voice rose above the white noise. Detectives, she screeched, and the duo looked around, before settling on a young woman waving frantically from across the room. Detectives, over here! Rogers waved back at her, recognizing her as Captain Sanford's assistant. Looks like we're about to find out, he muttered as they made their way through the chaos. What can we do for you, Becky? She brushed her matted hair from her forehead, deep bags under her wide eyes, insinuating that she hadn't left her post in days. The captain needs to see you right now. He's in his office. What did we do? Stevenson crossed his arms. Becky rolled her eyes. He told me to find someone competent, and it's truly a dark time if you're the best I could come up with. Even in the apocalypse, that one hurts, Stevenson replied, putting a jovial hand over his heart. She smiled and shook her head. Get in there, you two. The duo entered the captain's large office. Sanford sat behind his desk, the two chairs in front of him full of gigantic Latino men, a trio of six-foot-plus muscular tanned men standing along the far wall. Each one of them were covered in tattoos and armed to the teeth. Sorry, Captain, Rogers said, brow furrowing. Didn't mean to interrupt. It's okay, Rogers, come on in. Sanford replied, waving them forward. Turns out you have good timing. I have a few people for you to meet. Roger's eyes widened as the two men at the desk turned around. The captain leaned back. Detectives, I'd like to introduce Angel Rivas, heir to the throne of the Rivas cartel. Rogers cut in, raising his chin at the young man on the left. Currently under investigation for several dozen murders on both sides of the border. A little overdressed for the end of the world in those fancy slacks, but you don't look like the type to have ever worked a hard day in his life. I'm guessing that the whole apocalypse got you spooked about your place in the afterlife, and you're trying to make amends by turning yourself in? Angel growled and leaned forward to lash out, but his older companion shoved him back into his seat. That's a good boy, sit down, Roger snarled. Detective, you aren't being helpful, the older man replied as Angel slapped his hand away from him with a huff. Oh, my apologies, Mr. Cartel Man, Rogers replied, sarcasm dripping from his tongue. Sanford stood up. Detective Rogers, show our guests some respect. What the hell, Captain? The detective cried. Is everything okay? Blink twice if there's a bomb under your chair. Rogers, Sanford bellowed. Detective Rogers, the older Latino man said, voice calm and collected. My name is Rodriguez. I'm the second in command of the Rivas cartel. Your captain is in no danger, and in fact, we are here to help with the current situation. Help? The detective narrowed his eyes. We just came from the hospital where your men helped by shooting patients in the goddamned face. Detective, I understand you are upset, Rodriguez replied, putting up his hands. But those aren't our men. The men who stormed across the border are from the Mesa King, Angel added. I thought the mazes were your distributor, Stevenson cut in. Wouldn't that make them your men? Technically, yes, Rodriguez replied. But when this situation broke out this week, the gang leader, Juan Pablo, decided to make his move and take over the city. We don't condone what he and his men have done and have come up here to put a stop to it. Rogers rolled his eyes. Oh, good. You going to come over and negotiate a ceasefire or something? Angel pulled out a butterfly knife and flipped it around. The Rivas cartel doesn't negotiate, he said, and slammed the blade into the captain's desk. We dictate. That's good and all, Goldilocks, Rogers snapped. But it's going to take more than you and the three bears here to bring down their army. We brought in 5,000 of our own men, Rodriguez clarified. In addition, we have already made contact with two of his top lieutenants and brought them and their men over to our side. At the moment, we outnumber them. Rogers paced back and forth a bit, taking a deep breath. So what's the play? Not sure an all-out war on the streets of El Paso is in anyone's best interests. I agree with you, Detective, Rodriguez replied. A full-scale war would ultimately doom us all. Being isolated from the initial infection zone bought us a little time. But sooner rather than later, we're going to have a zombie epidemic on our hands. Not if they keep clearing out the city the way they are, Stevenson muttered. And the rest of the room went completely silent turning to look at him with a combination of confusion and disgust. Settle down, y'all. I'm not advocating their position, just stating a fact, Jesus. Roger shook his head and turned to their new tentative companion. Okay, Rodriguez, do 
Do you boys actually have a plan, or is this an unofficial brainstorming session? He asked. Because if it's the latter, then I'm going to need some coffee to get the gears turning. Rodriguez snapped his fingers and pointed to the door. The large, bald man nodded and exited the room. What just happened? Rogers looked from the doorway back to the cartel second in command. Well, detective, we do have a plan, but we're going to need you fresh. Rodriguez explained. I sent him to get you what you requested. The large guard reappeared in the room, holding a mug of piping hot coffee. He held it out to Rogers, who accepted it graciously. Sorry, the guard stammered in a thick accent. No cream. Rogers smiled and nodded. Thank you, big fella. He raised his mug in a toast and then took a happy sip. All right, let's hear it. Juan Pablo, second in command, is a squirmy little bastard named Miguel. Angel began. We get to him, he'll give up his boss. Stevenson crossed his arms and leaned against the doorframe, crossing his legs at the ankle. What makes you so sure about that? Angel sneered and snatched his knife from the desk, waggling it above his head. I can demonstrate on you if you wish. He'll talk. Rodriguez cut in, gently pushing his companion's hand down. Miguel is an ambitious one, so when we take out his boss, he'll be smart enough to know where that leaves him. And once we take him out, then what? Rogers asked. Everybody goes home and we call it a day? On the contrary, Rodriguez replied. We have proposed a partnership with your captain. The threat we face is very real and needs to be dealt with. Stevenson sighed. And now we're back to shooting people in the face. No, detective. Rodriguez put his hands up, palms out. We know what causes the transformation. So once the hostilities end, we will search out these people and quarantine them across the border. As we speak, shelters for the infected are being set up so these people can live out their last moments in peace. A hysterical laugh bubbled up from Roger's throat, and he shook his head. It truly is the apocalypse if we're contemplating partnering up with the Rivas cartel. Detective, it's already done, Sanford said firmly. As we speak, their men are forming squad with our officers to go out into the city to find the sick and eliminate any threats they find, be they human or zombie. Roger's jaw dropped. Captain, are you out of your mind? No, detective, I'm not. Sanford slammed his fist down on his desk. The fact is that between the virus, the wounded, the killed, and the deserters, we're badly outnumbered and outgunned. If we want any chance at saving the city, this is the only way to do it. Rogers pressed his lips into a thin line, clenching his jaw. He drew a deep breath between his teeth and let it out slowly, finally nodding his head. Okay, he conceded. Rodriguez, where are we going? There is an apartment building on the northeast side of the city, where we believe Miguel and his goons are holed up. His new companion replied. Stevenson sighed. So what, we just gonna drive up and knock on the front door? I'd recommend you stop by the armory on your way out, Sanford replied, taking his seat now that he was satisfied with his men's compliance. Detective Stevenson, you wanna show these boys the way? The detective waved his hand and opened the door, and the cartel members filed out after him, leaving Rogers alone with Sanford. Detective, I know what you're going to say, and I totally agree with you, the captain said as his subordinate took Rodriguez's seat and set his coffee on the desk. But our backs are against the wall. What choice do I have? I know, Captain, Rogers replied, rubbing his eyes. There's a reason why I'm just a detective and not in charge. Don't want that kind of responsibility. Just watch yourself, okay? Sanford nodded. You too, detective. Rogers downed the rest of his coffee and slammed the empty mug down on the desk, giving a salute before vacating the office to meet the others at the armory. Chapter 5 Stevenson looked back and forth between the two giant cartel members on either side of him in the back seat of Rodriguez's black SUV. So, you guys lift or what? He asked, amazed at the fact that their biceps were as big around as his head. The one to his left slowly turned and looked down at the diminutive detective. Crossfit, he replied, and then turned his attention back to the front, where Rodriguez turned the key in the ignition and Rogers settled into the passenger seat. Rodriguez pulled out behind the other black SUV in their small convoy, which Angel was driving, and headed towards the apartment building. 
The drive was brisk and devoid of resistance, every corner guarded by a mix of armed cartel members and officers alike. They pulled up to the building, which was a five-story modern mid-rise complex, with a handful of storefronts on one side and a large gated pool area adjacent to the all-glass front office. A small horde of about 30 zombies rushed towards the building, cut down by automatic fire coming from one of the apartments on the ground floor. What do you think? Rogers asked as they slowed to a stop. Go in through the office? Rodriguez nodded. Good a plan as any. The convoy started moving again, heading into the parking lot. As soon as they crossed the property line, bullets peppered the vehicles. Everybody out, Rogers cried as Rodriguez sharply turned to the right. But a spray of bullets caused the engine to sputter to a halt. Everyone poured out of the passenger side doors to take shelter behind the wheel wells. One of the big guards from the back seat flattened himself against the door. You need to get behind a wheel, Rogers cried. That door isn't gonna give you any cover. The thick cartel member rolled his eyes. I'm good, what the fuck do you know, gringo? A trio of bullets tore through the flimsy metal right next to him, and he dove to the ground behind the rear wheel, eyes wide in shock. Roger shrugged as he looked up at him, and the frazzled man gave him a slight nod to acknowledge that he was in the wrong. Unhel pulled up behind them, creating a long SUV barricade. Their crew jumped out, standing at the wheels and popping off a few shots while their leader crawled towards Rodriguez. Now what? he asked. Rodriguez inclined his head. We'll distract them while you ram your SUV into the front office. After that, we'll... The sound of tires exploding cut him off, and Angel's vehicle leaned to one side. Scratch that, detective. Rogers peeked over the hood of the car to survey the battlefield. There were about two dozen zombies between them and the building. The cartel members inside struggled to land headshots, bullets ripping through torsos. They're behind us, Stevenson screamed, he and his two new companions opening fire. A dozen or so zombies from the area ran towards them, attracted to the noise. Everyone behind Rodriguez's vehicle whipped around, firing into the new horde. They caught at least half of them, but a few reached the group, one managing to latch on to one of the cartel members firing at the building. Two zombies dragged him to the asphalt, gurgling screams as they tore into his flesh. His partner attempted to fire on the assailants, but three more zombies slammed into him. He reached up to grab one by the throat, but misjudged and put his hand right into the ghoul's mouth, losing three fingers. He shot the zombie point blank in the forehead, using its body to knock the other two to the ground. Enraged, he unloaded an entire magazine into the two corpses before reloading and pumping round after round into the feasting zombies, as well as his now-deceased comrade. As the gun clicked empty, he turned to the remaining huddled members of the convoy, only to receive a bullet to the forehead. Rogers turned to Angel, who lowered his still-smoking weapon. What the hell is wrong with you? He was bitten, Angel snapped, shrugging his shoulders with a scowl. People who get bit turn into those things. No fucking shit, dumbass, Rogers spat. He wasn't going to turn in the next five minutes, though, and in case you missed it, we're in the middle of a goddamned firefight. Angel snarled and lunged for the detective, but Rodriguez shoved him back before turning to Rogers. Detective, he said calmly, focus. Rogers took a deep breath and looked back over the SUVs. The guys inside the apartment building continued to fire, but continued to miss their targets pretty badly, oftentimes drawing nothing but air. Several more zombies rushed to join the dozen or so still by the window. We can use them as shields, Rogers declared, motioning to the unmoving corpses on the ground. Angel scoffed. Are you loco? Their guns will tear right through them. That's why we're gonna hold them high, the detective replied and shook his head at the quizzical expressions on the others. I don't know why Miguel hired the guys over there, but I can guarantee to you that it wasn't because they were great marksmen. They were having a lot of problems hitting the head, and last time I looked, they were aiming high. We turn these corpses into seven-footers, then that's what they're gonna aim for. That'll give us a chance to get up there. Angel crossed his arms. 
As soon as they see us carrying those things, we're done. They don't need to hit us in the head, you know. It's about a 40-yard run from here to the wall, Rogers insisted. Pro athletes run that in four seconds. We're not in the best shape, but I'm betting we can do it in under eight. Your two behemoths over there lead the way. The rest of us flank them and take out the zombies in our path. We get close enough, and we throw everything we have at the windows. With any luck, we'll take them out, or at least scare them off. Rodriguez pursed his lips for a moment, and then nodded. All right, let's do it. Rodriguez! Angel gaped. You're listening to this gringo? We have to get in there, his companion hissed. So tell me, do you have a better plan? Angel scrunched up his face as he muttered a string of curse words in Spanish under his breath, but then ultimately shook his head no. All right then, Rodriguez replied, and whistled to his other two cartel members. He called out something in Spanish, and they leapt up to grab suitable corpses. If you and your detective will take the left, Angel and I will take the right. Rogers nodded. It's going to be dangerous as hell, but we need to hold off as long as we can on the firing and get as close as possible. We start shooting and we're going to be the target of them and the zombies. These zombies are starting to thin out, Rodriguez said as he peeked over the top of the car. We need to move. He whistled one more time, and the two hulking guards hefted the bodies on their shoulders. The cartel duo and the detective duo got ready to move on Rodriguez's mark, and when he whistled, the guards led the way. As they ran, bullets hit the tall decoy zombies in the chest. As they got closer to the building, the gunfire intensified, and one bullet actually managed to find its mark, taking the corpse's head clean off. The gunfire paused as the creature kept coming. Likely the shooters were in shock at a headshot not keeping the creature down. When they reached ten feet from the horde, the group opened fire. As the battlefield cleared, one of the gunmen made eye contact with Rogers through the window. He quickly aimed, but the detective shot faster, causing the young man to duck. The guard with the headless corpse dropped it, bull rushing the last few ghouls and grasping one snapping creature by the belt and collar from behind. He stood up and heaved it through the window, sending the gunmen inside into a frenzy to try to kill the zombie now in their midst. Rogers and Rodriguez stood on either side of the window, and at the same time popped up and fired on the gunmen, ducking back down to wait for retaliatory shots. They didn't come. The duo turned back to the battlefield, where Stevenson and the guards were making sure that everything was dead amongst the piles of corpses. We gotta get inside, Angel screamed, firing on the next wave of thirty or so zombies that had been attracted to the firefight. Guess we're going in this way. Rogers said, and Rodriguez nodded, giving him a boost over the windowsill. The detective swept the room, making sure the gunmen bleeding out on top of a red mush zombie corpse were the only ones. Cover the door, I'll find something for the window, Rodriguez said, as he heaved himself through the window. Rogers nodded and moved across the apartment. As he approached the door, the handle moved, and he quickly ducked behind it, out of sight as a single cartel member entered. He rattled off something in Spanish before noticing bodies coming in through the living room window, and Rogers tackled him from behind. The two of them crashed to the floor, and Rogers smashed his fist into his opponent's face a few times, stunning him. You got him? Stevenson called. Rogers nodded. Yeah, lock the door. We need to have a chat with this one. Stevenson secured the door, and they dragged the semi-conscious man into the living room shoving him down beside his two dead friends. The two guards secured the window with furniture, freeing up Angel and Rodriguez to interrogate their fresh prisoner. Angel began rattling off rapid Spanish, but Rogers put up a hand. No, 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 he said. English. Fuck you, the cartel air snarled. Detective, Rodriguez cut in. Time is of the essence, and I'd be surprised if this man spoke even halfway passable English. I fully realize you don't trust us. No, Rodriguez, I don't, Rogers said. Given that a week ago, any one of you would have put a bullet in my face and not lost a moment's sleep over it, we still have a ways to go before we reach the trust stage. Now I want to know what he has to say, from his own mouth. Rodriguez nodded at Angel, who rolled his eyes, but sighed with compliance. English? he asked. The prisoner's voice was hoarse. 
Yes. Where is your bus? Angel asked. The prisoner's head lolled with grogginess. Not telling you a damn thing. Angel stared at him for a moment, and then leapt down and grabbed the guy in a headlock, jerking him off of the floor and dragging him over to the window. One of the guards moved a shelf out of the way, just enough so a zombie could squeeze its snapping maw through. Angel shoved the prisoner's face within six inches of the creature, its teeth clicking excitedly in anticipation of a meal. You want to rethink that? Angel purred. Okay, okay, the prisoner cried as the zombie's putrid breath grazed his face. Talk, the cartel heir demanded. The prisoner reached into his pocket as he hit the floor again, holding out a set of keys. He's, he's in the penthouse on the fifth floor. The elevator requires a key to access. It's the small silver one. Angel examined the keys and then tossed them to Rodriguez. How many men are up there? Miguel and two others, the prisoner wheezed. Angel faked a punch, causing the man on the floor to flinch. He laughed. Are you lying to me? I think Miguel would have more men than that. They're all out clearing the city, the prisoner pleaded. I swear, it's only Miguel and two others up there. Angel stood up. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? He asked and smiled. The prisoner eyed him warily and then offered a small smile. His eyes widened in horror a split second before Angel shot him between the eyes. What the fuck, man? Stevenson yelled. Angel shrugged. I did him a favor. Remind me never to ask you for anything, the detective muttered. Rodriguez raised a hand. We don't have time for this. We need to get to the penthouse. Rogers clenched his jaw and patted Stevenson on the shoulder. Chapter 6 The elevator doors closed behind the group. Angel, I need you to holster your weapon and get to the rear, Rogers instructed. The cartel air scowled. Bullshit, gringo, I ain't doing that. Rogers whirled and got right in his face, nose to nose. Listen to me, you hot-headed know-nothing, he hissed. We need to bring this guy to our side. He knows where the big boss is, and you guys said that he was... He inclined his head to Rodriguez. How did you put it? Ambitious, Rodriguez said. Right, ambitious, Rogers repeated, turning back to Angel. You go in there half-cocked, blowing people's heads off. There's a good chance he's gonna go down swinging instead of talking to us. Now holster your weapon and get in the back. Angel stared him down, unmoving. That's a nice speech, but I'm gonna stay right here, he said firmly. But I'll give you my word that I won't shoot anybody in the head. Rogers nodded and casually reached over to hit the button to open the doors. As they slid open, he shoved Angel back into the main floor hallway. The cartel air growled and drew his handgun as he found his footing. The detective aimed his own first. Put it down, he demanded, and Angel reluctantly lowered his arm. Good boy, now I want you to sit there and think about what you did. The doors closed, leaving the cartel air in the lobby. Rogers hit the button for the penthouse, and the elevator began its ascent. He sighed as he noticed Rodriguez staring at him in his periphery. What? he asked. You think I was wrong? Rodriguez shook his head. On the contrary, you were a hundred percent right. He's young and hasn't learned self-control yet. Based on some of the things we've investigated him for, Rogers mused. That's an understatement. Rodriguez just nodded, eyes thoughtful. The group readied their weapons as the elevator gave its ding at the top floor, and as soon as the door slid open, they fanned out in the narrow space, weapons drawn. Two shocked guards whipped around, but didn't have time to raise their weapons in the face of their attackers. Not a good idea, boys, Rogers warned as he, Rodriguez, and Stevenson kept them under aim. The two guards stalked over and collected the men's weapons. They shoved them towards a supply closet in the hallway, and Rodriguez stepped up as they bustled into the small space. I'm leaving one of my men here, he said coldly. If you open this door, he will turn this closet into your coffin, understood? The men muttered a sheepish si in unison before a guard slammed the door and barred it with a nearby bench. The rest of the group moved towards the end of the hallway, 
and slowly opened the door to the main residence. Stevenson gawked at the outlandish decor, a large chandelier hanging from the cathedral ceiling and a wall of windows giving a panoramic view of the city. Man, can you imagine the amount of tail this guy must have been pulling? Settle down there, Hef, Rogers replied. There was a roaring fire in the massive fireplace off to the side, a closed door on either side. So where you want to look first, Rogers asked. Rodriguez motioned to the single door across from the fireplace. If I know Miguel, he's probably sprawled out in the master bedroom. Thought you said he was ambitious. Rogers cocked his head. His companion barked a laugh. Ambitious in the sense that he wants to be the kingpin, not in the sense where he actually has to do anything other than issue orders. Amazing he's made it this far up the ladder. The detective let out a puff of air. Rodriguez nodded. That sentiment is more common than you think, detective. Rogers gave a nod, and the quartet moved towards the master bedroom door. They paused outside, and he gave a silent countdown with his fingers before flinging the door open. They leapt inside, and then recoiled at the sight of a short and hairy overweight man lounging on the bed in red bikini briefs and a matching silk bathrobe. Mother of God, man, Stevenson blurted. Who in their right mind thinks that's a good look? Rogers wrinkled his nose. Someone who grew up in a house without mirrors? What is the meaning of this? Miguel grunted, sitting up to let his gargantuan belly hang over his junk. Who are you? Rodriguez stepped forward. You know who I am, Miguel. Oh, please, Mr. Rodriguez, I am so sorry for my appearance. The older man whined, slipping off of the bed hastily. Please, give me just a moment to collect myself. He scurried over to the nightstand and slid into a pair of fuzzy slippers before securing his robe around himself. He cleared his throat and turned, approaching the group with a large fake smile pasted across his plump red face. Please, come into the main room, he said. I will get you some drinks and we can discuss business. He paused. We, we are going to discuss business, are we not? Rodriguez raised an eyebrow. Is that what you wish to do? Miguel reached out and slowly pushed down on Roger's gun and licked his lips nervously. Anything I can do to avoid the alternative, sir? Rogers grinned and holstered his weapon. Miguel, I'll take a scotch on the rocks. Coming right up, sir. The portly cartel wannabe slid past them and into the main room. Rodriguez nodded. Detective, I believe this might actually work. As if on cue, Miguel shrieked from the living room, and the group rushed back out to see him cowering behind the couch. Angel stood there, gun drawn, and let out a string of Spanish before making a beeline for Rogers. Rodriguez stepped into his path, straightening his shoulders up to full height. Move, Angel snapped. I have to teach this asshole a lesson. The only thing you have to do is calm down, Rodriguez insisted firmly. Angel took a step back, a blood vessel pulsating in his neck. Are you taking the American side? We have a mission to accomplish, and you're endangering it, his second in command declared calmly. Now sit down and calm yourself. The cartel air snarled. Do you have any idea who you are talking to? Rodriguez inclined his head towards the windows. Someone who will learn to fly if they don't learn how to take orders. Angel drew his bottom lip between his teeth, fear rippling in his eyes. There was a tense moment before he clenched his jaw and huffed, throwing himself into a nearby armchair in defeat. I believe you were going to get us some beverages, Miguel, Rodriguez said, and the quivering man in question rushed off to the kitchen. The sound of ice hitting glass echoed as the group all took seats around the comfortable living room. Angel glared daggers at Rogers as he sat down across from him, and the detective simply shot him a playful wink, knowing that there wasn't a damn thing the young man could do. Miguel bustled in with a tray of glasses and a bottle and set them down on the coffee table. Rogers picked up the bottle to pour and clucked his tongue. Well, that's a disappointment, he muttered. Miguel wrung his hands. Please, please forgive me, he pleaded. This was the only bottle that was in the kitchen. I, I can go see if they have something else. It's okay, Rogers waved him off with a sigh. 
Just disappointed it's only a 12-year-old scotch. You'd figure with digs like this they could afford better hooch. Rodriguez didn't bother to hide his smile of amusement. Well, Miguel, I'll get right to the point, he said, turning to the nervous man. We need to know where your boss Juan Pablo is. I know where he is, Miguel replied, and then took a deep breath, seeming to grow a little bit of confidence in the knowledge that he had something they needed. So, so what is in it for me? Angel pulled his fancy butterfly knife, flicking it around a few times, before stabbing it down into the coffee table. Your reward for telling us is you don't get to see what I can do with this, he sneered. Your boss has been a bad, bad boy, Rodriguez said, as Miguel went white as a sheet. Caused a lot of trouble on both sides of the border. Now we know you've played a role, but Senor Rivas is willing to overlook your transgressions and reward you if you are willing and able to help bring an end to the current hostilities. Miguel continued to wring his hands, mouth opening and closing a few times, before finally finding his voice. We can save specifics for a later discussion, he said, and cleared his throat. I will tell you where he is. There is a warehouse complex about a mile north of the West Side Open Reserve. I don't know the name, but it's a huge gray building with a hundred trucking bays. Well, that was easier than I thought, Stevenson piped up, leaning back and curling his arms behind his head. Getting the information is the easy part, Miguel replied with a shake of his head. Getting there will be a whole other ordeal. I left there eight hours ago and came in on the I-10. If I wasn't in an escorted vehicle, I would have been cut to shreds. Every exit and overpass has been reinforced with heavily armed men. Side streets are no better, as there are 2,000 men clearing the sick out house by house. The only way you are getting in there is if you are invited by Juan Pablo himself. I can't even get back in. There was a tense silence as everyone contemplated the reality of the situation. Rogers leaned forward. Where exactly is this warehouse? I told you, Miguel replied, pursing his lips. About a mile north of the preserve. The detective shook his head. No, where is it exactly? Is it close to the I-10? Can you see the interstate from it? What is close to it? Angel scoffed. What difference does it? Rodriguez shushed him in Spanish and motioned for the others to continue. I'd say it's about a mile east of the interstate, Miguel replied, scratching his head in thought. As far as what it's close to, nothing significant I can think of, outside of a wall of trees. That's our way in, then, Rogers declared. What are you talking about, gringo? Angel blurted. Did you not listen to Miguel? How in the hell are we getting to the woods? Rogers shrugged. Easy, we'll just start on the other side of them. You want to go hiking? Angel raised his eyebrows and let out an incredulous guffaw. Yep, the detective replied. Franklin Mountain State Park runs right up against the target. It's highly unlikely they are spending resources defending the forest, so we hike across it. There are several trails leading through it. Can't be more than four or five miles if we pick our entry point right. Angel laughed again. I don't believe this. Rodriguez, you don't think... I think you should learn the lesson of if you don't have a better idea, you should keep your mouth shut, Rodriguez snapped. As the cartel heir sulked back into his seat and crossed his arms across his chest like a pouty teenager, he turned back to Miguel. Thank you. Your help will not go unrewarded. However, we have one more favor to request. Miguel nodded emphatically. Please, anything you need. We need transportation, as your men did a good job of trashing our vehicles. Rogers said, downing the rest of his glass. Please, gentlemen, accept my sincerest apology, Miguel replied, and bowed as low as his belly would allow. I will go down with you and instruct them personally to escort you to the transportation you need. Rogers coughed. We kind of killed your men. Miguel choked on his breath and then composed himself. Even easier, he bellowed, wide grin stretching his face. Just head to the garage and take their vehicles. Should be a few SUVs on the second floor. Keys will be in them. Take them with my compliments. Rodriguez stood and shook his hand, whispering something in Spanish to him before the group headed for the door. I can with the cartel, Stevenson said to Rogers as they exited the penthouse. You sure we don't want to ask Miguel for some food and we can make an afternoon out of it? Have a picnic and just, you know, enjoy the company? Yes, I know, Stevenson. 
Rogers replied with a roll of his eyes. This day is turning out stranger than I could have imagined. Chapter 7 That trail will take us close to where we need to go. Rogers motioned to the path between the dense copse of trees. Everyone readied their weapons after shutting the doors to the vehicles, and the detective studied his compass against the map in his hand. The last half mile or so is going to be a bit rougher, though, since we'll have to go off the path to reach the warehouse. He folded the map and stuffed it into his pocket with the compass and checked his own weapon. Angel sneered. Oh, so you're a Boy Scout now? Eagle Scout, actually, but why split hairs? Rogers shrugged. Rodriguez started towards the path. We're wasting time, let's move. The thick trees provided good shade from the sun, but reduced visibility. Every snap or movement in the woods set the group on edge, forcing them to raise their weapons until they were sure it was an animal or a falling branch instead of a zombie or a cartel enemy. This hike is not going to be good for my health, Stevenson muttered as a squirrel skittered across a thick branch overhead, kicking down dirt and leaves on his head. As time wore on, they grew numb to the forest noises, the background noises not freaking them out so much, and were able to move at a brisker pace. Rogers pulled out his map as they passed a marker on the trail. There's going to be a pretty deep gorge in a half mile or so. Once we cross that bridge, it'll be time to veer off the path. We seem to be making good time, Rodriguez commented. I'm impressed, Rogers agreed. Even your big fellows are keeping pace. Usually guys that size don't have much stamina. Stevenson grinned. It's all that CrossFit, right, big guy? The two guards simply grunted in acknowledgement, and the others chuckled. As they came around a bend, however, the group froze at the sight of torn apart camping gear on the path. They raised their weapons and took defensive positions as Rogers and Rodriguez moved forward to inspect the scene. There were no bodies, but there was blood everywhere, shredded tents dripping crimson. Tent pegs and unused matches floated in a pool of blood directly in the middle of the path. What do you think? Rogers asked quietly. I think we need to move with haste. Rodriguez replied just as quietly and reached down to dip a finger in the pool. It's still lukewarm, so this happened recently. He wiped his fingers on an empty backpack. Rogers turned and waved for the others to follow quickly, and they scurried forward silently. They shuffled as quietly as they possibly could and met a lone zombie staggering out of the trees. It took off towards them at a run, and one of the hulking bodyguards turned and grasped the creature by the neck. He used its momentum to spin, lift, and crash it hard onto the ground. The corpse thrashed around violently, limbs flailing, but the guard held fast. Angel began to aim his gun, but Stevenson pushed his arm away, drawing a knife instead. The cartel air glared at the detective as he knelt and planted the blade into the zombie's skull, cutting off the thing's screech. The group froze from the noise, waiting for the fallout from the piercing noise. Screams and groans echoed in the forest, coming from all sides. It was impossible to see how many and from what direction with the thickness of the trees. Rogers aimed at the dirt path in the direction of the bridge and saw a half dozen tearing towards them. He took aim and fired, clipping one in the head. As it fell, several of the others tripped over their fallen comrade. We gotta move, he cried, and Rodriguez came up next to him, attempting to clear the path ahead. The rest of the group moved with them, firing into the trees as zombies leapt out from the dense woods. Some bodies fell, but some bullets only found foliage. Angel moved between the two leaders, but a zombie knocked him clean over from the side. He flung it off of him, regaining his footing quickly. You done fucked up he declared, and whipped out his knife. He flicked it around a few times while the zombie got back up, and then planted his foot in its chest. He kicked it down and then knelt, crushing its ribs with his knee while he stabbed it multiple times in the face. He stood and spit on the creature before jogging to catch up with Rogers and Rodriguez. Stevenson brought up the rear with the two bodyguards, fighting off five zombies together. The detective hit one with a clean headshot, 
as the other two grappled hand to hand with one zombie each. Stevenson dispatched the first one, and the second guard panicked and threw his corpse at a group of enemies emerging from the woods. Go, I got this, Stevenson barked at the first guard, and he nodded, taking off towards the bridge. The detective fired around the almost overwhelmed guard, hitting three ghouls in the head, ending their search for sustenance. The final zombie met the guard's hands, and he lifted it up over his head and dropped it over his knee, shattering its spine. He threw it to the side and grunted to Stevenson in thanks for his help. They took one more look at the top half of the corpse, desperately trying to claw its way along the ground to get to them. As they turned to leave, two zombies sprinted out of the trees and attached themselves to the beast of a guard. Stevenson didn't even have time to turn around before the man was on the ground, flailing and punching and fighting for his now much shorter life. Fuck, the detective cursed through clenched teeth, shooting a few more approaching zombies, but knowing that the guard had no chance now. He turned and sprinted towards the bridge, feeling terrible about it, but knowing it was the only way. As he dodged pools of blood and camping gear, four zombies burst from the woods and onto the path. He fired a shot behind him and took one out, but the next shot produced a hollow click that sounded like a nail in a coffin. They didn't let up, and he dove to the side, barreling into the woods. He ran through the trees, reloading as he dodged branches. The corpses chasing him weren't as agile, smacking into trees, but more joined him, somehow managing to keep up. A gooey hand grasped his shirt collar, and he lurched backwards, flinging his arm back to try to protect himself. His fist met with the trunk of a tall pine, and he wrenched around to see the zombie caught up in its branches, unable to get its mouth close enough for a meal. Stevenson finally clicked in the magazine and fired over his shoulder, but missed due to the pine branches obscuring his vision. Another zombie tore towards him from the front, and he easily dispatched it, firing over his shoulder again. When he missed a second time, he pressed the barrel of the gun up against the zombie's wrist and fired twice, tearing through the rotting flesh. The detective wrenched free, the severed hand flopping to the forest floor. He took off running, the pounding of his heart, not quite drowning out the footfalls of the zombies behind him, eventually finding his way back to the path. The bridge was within sight, and hope soared in his chest at the sight of Rogers and the others, waving wildly to him from the other end. Stevenson glanced behind him to see a flood of zombies filling the path about forty yards behind him. Eyes widening, he took off as hard as he could towards the bridge. Rogers motioned to the wooden structure, about fifty feet long and just wide enough for two people to walk shoulder to shoulder. We need to bring down this bridge once he's across, or else we're going to use all our ammo holding them off. Angel and the living bodyguard just shrugged, while Rodriguez pulled out a flask. He calmly unscrewed the cap as he walked a few feet onto the bridge and dumped the contents onto the wood. As soon as Stevenson hit the other side, running full tilt towards him, Rodriguez knelt and set the bridge ablaze. Rogers rushed forward and pulled out his own flask flinging the flammable liquid forward through the flames like a priest dishing out holy water. The flying alcohol did a great job of creating a large wall of fire. Stevenson leapt through the blaze like a dynamo and hit the dirt with one leg on fire. He rolled back and forth, and the bodyguard kicked some dirt onto him to put it out. The fire on the bridge grew, and the zombies bottlenecked into the other end. Rogers and Rodriguez stood at the edge of the structure and aimed downrange, waiting for the footsteps to get closer. They opened fire, aiming at chest height to create a barricade of zombies and let the fire do its work. The blaze grew to an inferno, and there were a series of sharp cracks before the bridge began to wobble under the intense heat and weight of the horde. One flaming zombie staggered almost to the guarding duo, but fell flat on its face as the structure finally gave way tumbling into the gorge below. Rodriguez and Rogers pulled out their flasks, 
giving a little toast before finishing off what little was left in them. Let me guess, tequila? Rogers asked. Rodriguez shook his head. Detective, I would expect better from you, throwing out such a racial stereotype like that. If you must know, I guessed tequila because I saw how fast it went up, he defended with a laugh. Brought back some bad college memories where I had to go a semester without eyebrows. Rodriguez smiled. If we live long enough, I think I would like to hear that story. Hell, that wasn't even the best story from that week, Rogers said. But I'll happily share it. His companion clapped him on the back, and they turned to the others. Stevenson, you okay? Yeah, I'm medium rare, the detective groaned as he got to his feet. So I'll live. Rogers inclined his head to the bodyguard. Sorry about your friend, he said sincerely. His companion just grunted and nodded. Rodriguez checked his gun. All right, let's get moving. This isn't over yet. Chapter 8 Well, detective, what do you think? Rodriguez asked quietly. Rogers peered through the bushes atop the tree-lined ridge overlooking the warehouse. There was a small building with a dozen or so bays, and a much larger building with around a hundred bays, separated by a large parking lot. Several transport trucks docked on both buildings, and a dozen or so guards roamed the grounds. Rogers pursed his lips when he noted that the smaller building was largely ignored by the guards. I think our luck isn't anywhere near good enough for Juan Pablo to be in the small building. I tend to agree, Rodriguez said. It appears as though the guards are focused on the main building. The question is, how do we get there? I don't know about y'all, but my ammo situation isn't exactly conducive to a large-scale firefight. Stevenson cut in. Angel rolled his eyes. Even if it was, you wouldn't stand a chance against Juan Pablo's best. Hand-selected, well-trained, and heavily armed. I'm sure your friends at the hospital thought the same thing. Stevenson shot back with a smirk. Last time I checked, they weren't on the right side of the ground anymore. Before Angel could lunge at the detective, Rodriguez piped up. We need to get into the main building. I would say we could take the long way around and circle the place, Rogers mused. But who knows how many men we'd encounter along the way. What about a diversion? Stevenson asked. Distract them on one side while we get into the building on the other. Rogers and Rodriguez nodded in unison. I think I know how we're doing this, Rogers said as he surveyed the area. Anybody have a bandana, handkerchief? When there was no reply, he raised his eyebrows. A bolt of fabric? Rodriguez suddenly caught on to what he was thinking and said something in Spanish. The bodyguard removed his shirt and handed it to Rogers. Stevenson eyed the intricate tattoos covering the man's entire chest and back. Muy bueno. The big guy just grunted in response. All right, you boys get down to the far end of the small building, Rogers instructed. When you see the guards go by, give me the signal and I'll get the fuse lit. With any luck, it'll go up in a fireball and give us a chance to get across to the main building. How are we getting in? Angel asked. Look closely at the trucks and the bays, Rogers replied, pointing. There is a little bit of a gap on both sides. It's probably going to be a tight squeeze, but we should be able to get in that way. Rodriguez nodded. Good luck, detective. Rogers cautiously emerged from the tree line and rushed towards the small building. At the sight of two guards coming into view, he hit the deck, flattening himself into the moderately tall grass. He hoped he was alone in there. Being in Texas, he could have been cozying up to a scorpion or snake's home. He couldn't help but feel like it was a little nice to be worried about that kind of thing instead of getting infected by walking corpses. When the guards turned around and walked back the way they came, he leapt to his feet and ran over to the vehicle. He drew his knife and wedged open the gas cap and shoved the sweaty t-shirt as deep as it would go. He looked to the opposite end of the building where Rodriguez had his arm extended high in the air. Rogers nodded, standing and waiting and once Rodriguez pointed his finger and thrust his arm down, the detective lit the shirt on fire. He rushed to join the group, crouching behind the corner of the small building. How long until it blows? Angel asked, as Rodriguez kept watch around the corner. Rogers shrugged. 
Fuck if I know, man, he admitted. What's the standard burn rate of a sweaty tank top? Before Angel could reply with some kind of snarky comment, the car detonated. A massive fireball punched high up into the air, and the percussion rattled the windows of the building. Stevenson grinned. Apparently 30 seconds. Rodriguez waited another beat, watching a few guards run towards the blast with their guns at the ready. As soon as they passed, he waved the group forward. Let's go. They darted to the edge of the building and looked over the large parking lot. It was another 50 yards to the main building, but the guards had all run over to the blaze behind the smaller compound. The group sprinted across the lot unnoticed and ducked behind one of the large 18-wheelers. Rogers ran up to the docking bay. There was a four-foot gap between the truck and the wall, and he grasped the platform to hoist himself up. At the sound of footsteps, he dropped back down to the asphalt, motioning for everyone to hug the wall. He watched footsteps exit the bay and face away from him, likely looking out at the explosion outside. Rogers motioned for Rodriguez to give him a boost, and the cartel member silently pushed his foot up to get him up onto the platform. He silently moved behind the distracted guard and jerked him back by the collar, smacking the back of his head against the concrete. He put a knee to the man's chest and covered his mouth, cocking his gun and putting it to the man's sweaty head. Hola, Rogers said, as the others clambered up onto the platform. The man's eyes went wide as saucers, fear evident in his orbs, as Stevenson and the bodyguard wandered over to the warehouse side to keep watch. Angel and Rodriguez knelt next to their new captive. Nice job, detective, Rodriguez said. Rogers grinned. Thanks. You want to interrogate him? Be my guest, his companion offered. Rogers leaned down so that his face was all his prisoner could see. Do you understand English? He asked in a low voice. The man nodded. Do you understand that if you speak above a whisper or try to alert anyone that I will shoot your balls off? Rogers continued and shoved the gun into the man's crotch. He nodded yes with even more intensity. Good, Rogers replied, and slowly peeled his fingers from the man's mouth. Now where's your boss, Juan Pablo? The man drew in a ragged breath. He, Rogers shoved the gun against his nuts in a warning for the volume of his voice. He's in the main office, the man whispered. Far side of the building. He motioned in the direction they needed to go, which was conveniently the opposite side of the car explosion. There's a door beside the brick room that leads to the offices. You can't miss it. Rogers nodded. How many men are back there with him? I, I don't know. The prisoner grimaced at the pressure on his family jewels. I swear I don't know. They don't let me back there. The detective released his gun a little. You believe him? Generally speaking, Rodriguez said with a shrug, a man wouldn't risk his balls over something that small. Rogers nodded. You're probably right. Angel pulled out his knife, and the detective smacked his hand away. What the fuck are you doing? Well, what do you propose we do with him? Angel snapped with his signature scowl. Rogers looked behind him and saw that the truck door was halfway open. He dragged their prisoner inside before giving him a forceful pistol whipping, knocking him out. He ducked out and carefully pulled the truck door down, doing his best to limit the noise. There we go, he said, smacking his hands together as if dusting them off. Body concealed and no blood stain to set off the alarms. Angel threw his arms up. But why leave him alive? Not everybody needs killing, Rogers shot back. You saw him? He was like 50 with dirty torn clothes. He didn't exactly look like a huge threat, did he? You'd better be right, Angel warned. Rodriguez checked his gun. Come on, he said with a wave. Let's get to the office. Chapter 9 They moved quickly and quietly through the empty warehouse, through rows and rows of boxes stacked floor to ceiling. They knelt down along the wall by the office door, Rogers in front. This door opens towards us, he said to Rodriguez beside him. I'll fling it open and you lead the way. That's very generous of you, detective, his companion replied with a smile. 
to allow me to go first into a room that is potentially filled with armed men wishing to do us harm. Well, I figure since you're the second in command of the Rivas cartel, they might think twice before shooting you, Roger said with a shrug. Or at the very least, hesitate long enough for me to get a shot off. Hard to argue with that, detective. Rodriguez nodded and grinned. I'm ready when you are. Rogers got into position, holding the doorknob, and nodded to the group. He did a quick silent countdown and then opened the door. There was a long hallway with several offices on either side of it and rows of glass windows. Rodriguez carefully moved up to the first one and peered inside. Rogers checked the one across from him. Both were dark and the doors were locked. They repeated the process on the second set as the other three entered the hallway behind them. As Rogers and Rodriguez reached the third set of offices, there was movement around the hallway corner on the far end. Put him on the ground, somebody yelled, and the entire group aimed at the two AK-47s pointing at them around the corner. Put him on the ground! I don't have a shot, do you? Rogers murmured, keeping as steady as possible so as not to spook their assailants. Rodriguez swallowed. No. Your office locked? Rogers pursed his lips. Rodriguez sighed. Yep. One of the men fired a warning shot into the air, and the cartel member and the detective slowly and gently bent to lay their guns on the ground. Just as the two of them stood back up, Angel shoved past them, a cocky smirk on his face as he spread his hands, strutting down the hallway. The two men emerged from around the corner, aiming at him. Do you know who the fuck I am? Angel snapped. The two men looked at each other before turning back to the young man. I said, do you know who the fuck I am? He repeated, smacking a hand off of his chest. I'm Angel Rivas of the Rivas Cartel. I demand that you take us to see Juan Pablo immediately. The men hesitated, but slightly raised their guns. He held up a finger to warn them to wait. If you pull that trigger, he purred menacingly. My father will find you. He will take you to your family and cut off your eyelids so you can watch him skin them alive. After that, he will seal you away in a room with them, where you'll spend the last days of your miserable little lives listening to them whimper as their final painful breaths leave their bodies. Stevenson's breath caught in his throat. God damn. The guards lowered their weapons and motioned for the group to follow them. As Rogers retrieved his gun, he noticed that they still had their fingers on the triggers. Last door at the end of the hall, one of them declared. No sudden movement, or we will end you, threat or not. Angel nodded and strutted down the hall like he owned the place. The rest of the group followed after him, though not quite as cocky. My apologies, Rodriguez. We should have sent him in first, Rogers said, giving his companion a playful punch to the shoulder. Rodriguez didn't reply, only gave a pained smile. Before the detective could inquire or think about that, Angel threw open the doors to the big office. It was a huge conference room, set up now as a giant office for a narcissistic boss. A younger man in his early thirties sat behind a dark wooden desk. He had dark, slicked hair, and his suit didn't have a scuff on it. He raised his eyebrows as Angel made his grand entrance. Angel Rivas, it has been a long, long time since our paths have crossed, Juan Pablo said, his voice dripping with charm. What's it been, two years, three? The younger man shook his head. Do you not remember last summer? Juan stood up from his seat and walked in front of it, leaning back on the wood as Angel stopped in the middle of the room. The group clustered behind him the two AK-47 wielding guards lingering in the doorway. Oh, yes, Juan smiled. I had almost forgotten you were at the police station. You were quite a wild man, if memory serves. He put a finger to his lips in thought and then raised it in the air. Yes, you were the gouger. Gentlemen, did you know that you were in the presence of a legend? He stepped forward, patting the young man on the shoulder. This man, this legend, he vigorously pointed his finger at Angel. He did things I never would have contemplated. There were three, or was it four? No matter. There were several officers who took it upon themselves to do what they believed was the right thing. They saw some of their fellow comrades moving some of our product through the city. 
and decided to alert the Federales of their activities. But little did they know, their contact was one of ours. He began to pace around the room, alternating between grandiose hand gestures and clasping his arms behind his back. A few days later, Angel and some of his men show up and join us on a trip to the station. We waltzed right in, padlocked the door, and chased the vermin out from their hiding place into the center of the room. These men, these scum, needed to be dealt with decisively. If it had been up to me, I would have put a gun to the base of their skull and fired. He waggled his finger at Angel. But this man, this man wanted to send a message. He ordered the other officers to hold them down as he scooped their eyeballs out with a rusted spoon, forcing the men who were on our payroll to get up close and personal with the consequences of betraying us. One by one, he blinded these men, scarring them in a way that would send a message to anyone who gazed upon them. You could see it on the faces of every man and woman in that room. Every scream, every plop of an eyeball hitting that dirty floor. This had more impact than any amount of money or threats could have. But he wasn't finished, oh no. With every socket cleaned out, he pulled the police chief over to them and shoved his face into theirs. He told the chief that each and every one of these men were to be kept on the force, working in the station every single day. They were to be a reminder of what happens when you go against his family. He paused, hands behind his back as he surveyed the room. Angel remained stoic while the detectives looked both horrified and disgusted. Rodriguez betrayed no emotion, while the guards seemed amused. The stories of that brutality spread like wildfire throughout the neighboring police forces. Juan continued, waving a hand as if over a kingdom. Within a matter of weeks, we no longer had to recruit officers. We had them volunteering to be in our service. This man deserves our utmost respect. You deserve some too, Juan Pablo, Angel replied, and they embraced like long-lost brothers. This was your plan, after all. Stevenson poked his partner in the ribs. Rogers, what's going on? He hissed. We're fucked is what's going on, Rogers replied. Rodriguez clenched his jaw. I'm sorry, detective. He pulled his handgun and pointed it at his ex-companions, motioning for them to drop their weapons. They did so and raised their hands. He waved them over to the corner. Wait a goddamn minute, Rodriguez, Angel declared. I know you weren't about to rob me of my fun. He stalked over to Rogers, licking his lips. You've been smarting off to me all day, boy. It's time to show you the consequences of disrespecting me. The detective braced himself, but Angel tore away from him and grabbed Stevenson by the back of his shirt. He dragged him back to where Juan stood and then slammed his butterfly knife into the back of the detective's knee. Rogers lunged as Stevenson screamed, but Rodriguez held on to him. Angel chuckled and kicked him down to one knee, wrapping a hand around his neck as he skimmed the blade around the detective's face, leaving some deep gashes and some shallow red lines. You better have your fun with me, Stevenson spat, because our boys back at the station will get you. Angel let out a hysterical laugh and stepped back, bracing himself on one Pablo who joined in the hearty laughter. Detective, I want to thank you, Angel said. That's the funniest shit I've heard in a long while. He wiped a tear from his eye and leaned down to cock his head as he ran the blade lightly along Stevenson's neck. Nobody is going to avenge you, detective. Would you like to know why? The detective stubbornly pressed his lips together, chin jutting out defiantly. Juan Pablo, would you like to tell him? Angel sneered. The cartel boss clapped his hands together with glee. With pleasure. He began his leisurely pacing again. For years, we have been forced to live in your shadow. Extreme poverty on our side, while you Americans embrace decadence. Anytime we tried to pull ourselves up out of the gutter, you Americans would smack us down to keep us in our perceived place. Well, when this sickness began to spread throughout the land, I knew it was our moment to strike. After securing our city, we came into yours to claim it as our own. Seeing as how at one time it was ours and was unjustly taken from our ancestors, I felt it was the right thing to do. He paused, stroking his chin, and then turned, switching directions. 
However, we knew a full frontal assault on the city would be a war we wouldn't be able to win, especially with the nearby military base filled with troops. So we devised a plan. My men would come into the city and start trouble, and shortly after that, Angel and his men would come riding to the rescue to help out an overwhelmed military and police force. Little did we know, the military was going to cut bait and run away, making our jobs all the easier. Roger's face went white as snow as the reality of the situation sunk in. Stevenson's sick sway looked like he wasn't faring much better. That's right, detective, Angel cooed, grinning from ear to ear in his captive's defeated face. All of your friends are dead. Shortly after your captain paired up my men with yours, they were executed, with the military abandoning the city and the police force eliminated. El Paso has finally been returned to its proper owners. Stevenson thrashed against the devil's hand. You son of a fucking whore. I'm gonna gut you from your throat all the way down to your balls. You're gonna wish you never- His threat cut off on a wet, garbled gag as Angel plunged his knife deep into the detective's throat. Rogers screamed in agony as blood poured out of his best friend. But Rodriguez held tightly, clutching the man upright as all the weight went out of him. He knelt down, staring deep into the victim's eyes as he watched the life drain from him. No, detective, you won't, he purred. The last thing you will ever experience in this life is me staring you down and reminding you that when I find your family, they will meet the same fate as you unless your wife is hot, in which case she'll get a little something extra. Stevenson grasped his killer's shirt, twisting it slightly before his strength gave out, and his hand flopped to the floor, consciousness seeping out of him with the blood. Rogers found his fight through his shock and jerked against his captor's arm, but Rodriguez punched him in the gut hard, sending him to his knees, winded. You son of a bitch, Rogers wheezed and spat at his feet. Rodriguez grabbed the detective by the throat, shoving him up against the wall. Head east on the Iden to Fabens, he whispered rapidly, lips ghosting Roger's ear. They are coming from the west. I will send people when I can. He shoved him back down onto the floor and aimed his gun at the stunned man. Rodriguez gave him a wink and a nod before he fired, the bullet tearing through Roger's left ear. The blast sent him careening to the ground, wound to the floor, a pool of blood growing beneath his pale face. He drew in a deep, ragged breath and held it. Woo! Angel cried, leaping to his feet as Stevenson's body flopped forward. The city is ours! He pointed to Rodriguez with a wild grin on his face. You, you have done a fantastic job. My father will hear of this, and you will be rewarded. The older man nodded. I appreciate that, but our job is not finished yet. Oh, our men can do the mop-up duty, Angel replied, waving his hands dismissively. Juan Pablo, you have some beer so we can celebrate? What kind of host would I be if I didn't? Juan replied. Cooler is behind the desk. Angel, Rodriguez piped up. Your father will be arriving in a matter of hours. Do you want him to find us at City Hall with fortifications being constructed? Or do you want him to find you and Juan Pablo drunk off your asses at the warehouse with the goods we need for the fortifications? Angel defiantly stalked behind the desk and grabbed two cold bottles, handing one to his well-dressed partner. Not gonna tattle, are you? He teased as the two cracked them open, heading for the exit. Get moving and you'll be fine, Rodriguez replied coldly and followed everyone out. Rogers remained motionless on the floor. He told himself it was out of fear of being discovered, but he knew deep down it was shock and pain. Chapter 10 A half an hour later, Rogers couldn't stay still any longer, his joints screaming at him to move. He figured his enemies had plenty of time to vacate the premises by that point, and rolled over with a groan. He staggered to his feet, applying pressure to the sticky wound on the side of his head. He wrinkled his nose as he pulled his hand away, finding it covered in crimson. His mouth went dry at the crumpled heap in the center of the room that used to be his best friend. He fell to his knees at Stevenson's side, and tears pricked the corners of his eyes. 
At least Angel had angled the knife so that he hadn't had to see his friend come back as one of those monsters. I'm sorry, Stevenson, he said, clenching his fists as his sorrow churned into anger in his chest. You have my word that bastard will pay. He patted his partner on the chest in a silent goodbye and looked around the room. But first things first, friend. I've got to get out of here in one piece. He spotted a coat rack by the door and headed over, digging through the pockets of a trench coat. He found a black scarf and gingerly wrapped it around his head, securing it tightly in hopes that it would stop the bleeding from what felt like a thumping geyser in the side of his skull. He walked over to the desk and rummaged through the drawers, hoping to find a weapon. Instead of a gun, he managed to find a silver letter opener. He pressed his finger on the slightly rounded tip, groaning at how blunt it was. Great, Rogers muttered. Looks like it's an eye shot or nothing with this thing. He walked towards the door, pausing one last time at his fallen friend before shaking his head in sadness. Vengeance boiled in his gut, and he pressed his lips into a thin line before leaving the room. The warehouse was almost completely empty. Several of the trucking bays were missing the trucks that had been there before, and many boxes had been moved from the main floor. Rogers moved as silently as he could, not wanting to attract any attention from enemies, be them living or dead. As he crept towards the middle portion of the warehouse, he heard a few voices speaking in Spanish. He ducked behind some boxes, readying his makeshift weapon as they approached. They grew louder, and he fell into a crouch, ready to spring. As the two men came into view, he pounced, tackling one from the side and smashing him into the other, sending them all to the concrete. He struck quickly on the first man, taking advantage of their surprise to grab his throat and thrust the letter opener directly into his eye. When the hilt met Skull, Rogers leapt onto the second man, who was struggling to unholster his handgun. The detective growled with animalistic fury as he clamped his hands around his victim's throat, eyes wild as he stared down at the reddening face of the man below him. He continued to squeeze with all his might, long after his opponent stopped moving, regulating his breath and his heartbeat. When he pried his hands free, he relieved the bodies of their weapons and ammunition and gave them a pat down, relieved to find a set of keys. He pocketed them and cocked one of the guns, continuing his journey through the warehouse. Let's just hope you parked nearby, he murmured to himself as he approached an open bay door. He shimmied forward and cautiously peeked out, seeing no movement save for the little bit of smoke rising from the car he'd blown up. He hopped down to the asphalt and skirted the building, peering around the corner. There was a jeep standing by itself, with two guards standing beside it having a cigarette and shooting the shit in Spanish. Their backs were to Rogers, and he raised his gun before silently stepping around the corner. He glided forward with cat-like grace until he was within killing range. With two quick pops, both men dropped to the ground, squirming in pain. They rolled over, mouths agape in shock and fear, and one of them attempted to raise his rifle. Rogers put a bullet between his eyes, and then stalked up to the other one, who began to whine in Spanish, something that sounded very much like begging. The cold detective stared down at him with detached eyes. The pleas fell on deaf ears. Any empathy he had had at the beginning of the day had been extinguished along with his best friend's life. Adios, Rogers said, and fired. He looted the corpses for more guns and ammo before hopping into the vehicle. He fumbled with the keys, selecting the one with the right symbol on it to slide into the ignition. He fired it up and put it into gear, punching the accelerator. He drove about 20 feet before slamming on the brakes. Where in the fuck am I going to go? He groaned. I know I have to get to the other side of the I-10, but how do I get there? He swallowed hard, knowing that a trip down the freeway would be a suicide run. He glanced back at the woods and let out a deep sigh. His long day was just getting longer. Chapter 11 Hours later, Rogers trudged his way through the mountainous state park. 
He'd long since abandoned his vehicle when the path he'd been on had narrowed too much. The sun hung low in the sky, not quite dusk, but rapidly approaching it. The air was thick with that sense of death and danger that had held since the outbreak, but also a desperation as well. That feeling that he had nothing left, that he needed to carry on, needed to remind himself that he still had to fight even though everything that mattered to him was gone. He tensed at the sound of gunshots in the distance, freezing to strain his ears. As they echoed again, he relaxed, estimating that the shooters were far enough away that they weren't a threat. Rogers eventually emerged from the thick trees into a clearing and stared down at the city below. He clenched his jaw at the sight of muzzle flashes all over the place, as if a wild celebration was going on. He stared daggers at it, imagining himself covered in the blood of his enemies, standing atop a pile of bodies, holding Angel Rivas's severed head. He turned, fire in his heart, and headed up a nearby hill, and then froze at the top. A group of elderly people sat in the grass, several young children tussling around them. The older people looked like a deer caught in the headlights at the sight of the man cresting the hill with a bloody scarf around his head, carrying four guns. The children noticed him and stopped, curling up with their elders, and the closest man cleared his throat, pushing a toddler behind him as he addressed Rogers. Are you here to do us harm? He asked, wrinkled face pale. The detective shook his head at the gray-haired man. No. You have nothing to fear from me. The man pursed his lips for a moment and then waved him over. Well, if that's the case, then why don't you join us? He asked. We don't have a whole lot, but we can spare a bottle of water if you're interested. Rogers nodded and holstered his weapon, securing the rifle on his back before striding over. He took a seat beside the old man and gratefully accepted a lukewarm bottle of water. The name's Barry, the old man introduced staring at the blood-crusted side of his new acquaintance's face. Rogers chugged half of the bottle in a single gulp, avoiding curious gazes as he stared down into the trees. I'm Detective Rogers, he finally replied. At least I was when the day began. Forgive me for being blunt, Detective, Barry said slowly, but it looks like you've had a hell of a day. Barry, my friend, Rogers replied unable to stop the exhausted chuckle from escaping his lips. That doesn't even begin to describe it. The old man inclined his head to one of the women next to him. Helena, can you please bring the first aid kit over here? It's fine, really, Rogers insisted. Barry shook his head. It's no trouble. An older lady with dark brown hair headed over, carrying a plastic grocery bag filled with rudimentary medical supplies. Rogers cocked a small smile. Looks like one of those high-end first aid kits. Nothing but the best for you, detective, Barry replied with an exaggerated wave of his hand. Rogers raised an eyebrow. So tell me, Helena, were you at least a nurse before this all went down? No, she replied as she approached him with her hands full. But I did raise four boys on a school teacher's salary. With our lack of money, the only time I'd take them to the hospital was if they lost a significant appendage. Everything else I took care of. She reached up and began to unwrap the makeshift bandage. Rogers chuckled. Well, as you'll soon find out, I am missing an ear. She smirked. I said, significant appendage. He nodded and then winced as she peeled the final layer of the scarf away from his head. The wound was pretty significant, ripping the ear completely off of his head. He swallowed hard as the air hit it, and she opened the bottle of antiseptic. Here it comes, cowboy. Helena said, and before he could respond, she splashed it on the side of his head. He clenched his jaw as the sight of his head erupted in a fresh wave of burning pain and let out a choked, thank you, before letting out a deep, ragged breath. So, Barry, he asked when he caught his breath, and Helena began to dab lightly around the wound. What are y'all doing up here? The cartel is on a warpath, Barry replied with a deep sigh. At first, they were just taking out people who had the sickness, or who they thought had it. But after they ambushed the police, they started killing anyone they didn't think could be useful. The people on our street were all rounded up and put into an office. 
They went person by person, pulling out anyone who was young and healthy, taking them to God knows where. Eventually, they got down to just us in the room. He paused, voice thickening. They, they started shooting us one by one. One man tried to fight back, but was unsuccessful, so they tortured him for a few minutes before finally putting him down. Guess it was their way of telling us to sit down and take it. I thought we were done for until a neighborhood teenager busted in with a handgun and started firing wildly. He hit one of the men in the chest and distracted the other gunman long enough for a couple of us to overwhelm him. Once freed, we came up here, since we didn't really have any place else to go. Helena finished bandaging up the detective's ear, leaving a huge white gauze pad on the side of his head, secured with white medical tape. There you go, all patched up. We'll have to keep an eye on it, however. Thank you, Helena, he said with a warm smile. They sat in silence for a few minutes, the echoes of the gunfire in the celebration below, a macabre background to what should have been a peaceful night in the forest. Detective, Barry finally said, is any place safe for us? Rogers took a deep breath, glancing down at the toddler peeking at him from behind the old man's back her big brown eyes wide and curious. I was instructed to go to Fabens, he replied. Told it was safe there. Barry raised an eyebrow. Who told you that? The man who did this, Rogers said, pointing to his bandaged ear. Barry's eyes widened in horror and confusion. Why in the world would you take advice from that man? Because he very easily could have put the bullet here, the detective replied pointing at his forehead, and he chose not to. Barry nodded thoughtfully. Very well, but that's going to be quite the journey, especially for some of us old fogies. Any plans on how to get out there? We'll head east on the 601, Rogers explained. It runs between Fort Bliss and the airfield. With the military cut and tail and running, it will hopefully be vacant. There are a couple of stores along the way, so with any luck, we'll find some transportation to help us out. Barry nodded. If we're going by the store, we might consider picking up some supplies. We barely have enough food and water to get us through tomorrow. Well, in that case, we'd better get a move on, Rogers declared. My guess is the cartel is going to celebrate their victory tonight before branching out and looting the outlying stores. So it's tonight or nothing for us. Agreed, Barry said. I'll get my people ready to go if you want to lead us out. Rogers nodded and got to his feet downing the rest of his warm water, before staring back at the raucous city. He clenched his jaw. His retribution would have to wait. Chapter 12 Rogers drove the lead vehicle slowly down the darkened highway towards the small town of Fabens. In reality, town was a bit of a stretch. It was really a single road leading off of the interstate, with a handful of storefronts lining it. There were two residential streets, running parallel to the main drag, filled with low-end housing. The detective kept a keen eye out for trouble, and was disconcerted by the lack of anything. No movement, no zombies, no cartel, nothing. He slowed to a crawl and moved past several stores, before a set of headlights flashed them in the distance. What do you think, Barry? Rogers asked thoughtfully. He shrugged. If I didn't know better, I'd assume someone was awaiting your arrival. Here's hoping they're friendly. Rogers cocked his handgun. Just in case they aren't. He led the convoy towards the flashing headlights, pulling into a parking lot in front of a strip mall. There were two SUVs in the lot, one of them with a moving trailer attached to the back. Y'all stay in the car, Rogers instructed. When I get out, I want you to get behind the wheel. If this goes south, at least you'll have a chance. Barry nodded. Be careful. The detective slowly got out of the vehicle, standing behind the door to hide his gun behind it. A few tense moments passed before two cartel members got out of the opposing lead SUV. The passenger held an AK-47, but kept it pointed at the ground. The driver was a young, well-dressed man, somewhere in his thirties of average height and build. Rogers wrinkled his nose at the fact that he wore sunglasses even though it was nighttime. I assume that you are Detective Rogers, the man called. The detective squared his shoulders. 
I could be, who wants to know? My name is Francisco, he replied, spreading his hands. I'm a close associate of Rodriguez. Roger's shoulders relaxed a bit, and he walked around to the front of the car, still holding his handgun. Is that really necessary, detective? Francisco pointed at the weapon. Rogers motioned to the rifleman. Is that really necessary, Francisco? The man smiled and waved for the man to put the weapon back in the car. He complied immediately, and Rogers holstered his own. Francisco approached and extended his hand, and the detective hesitated for a moment before firmly shaking his hand. The cartel member's face erupted in a smile. It's a pleasure to meet you, detective. You want to tell me what you're doing here? Rogers asked. Hell, you want to tell me what I'm doing here? It's quite simple, detective, Francisco replied. Some of us in the Rivas cartel disagree with the current course of action. Rodriguez, myself, and others have taken it upon ourselves to right some of the wrongs that are taking place. Rogers crossed his arms. So y'all are the good guys now? Francisco let out a deep belly laugh. Thank you, detective. I needed that. He gasped, wiping faux tears from his eyes. No, I assure you, we are very much still the bad guys. However, we are bad guys with rules that we dare not break. And one of those rules is being against the senseless murder of civilians. We understood that drastic measures needed to be taken to combat the plague that was rampaging through our cities. But we believe that shouldn't include murdering people like the ones in your caravan. Rogers clenched his fists. Then why didn't you do something to stop it? Because we are in the extreme minority, detective, Francisco replied, a hint of regret in his voice. Speaking up would have done nothing but sign our own death warrants. Our only chance is to operate in the shadows. Understandable, Rogers replied with a nod. So what am I supposed to do? What is Rodriguez's grand plan for me? There is no grand plan, detective. Only an opportunity, Francisco replied gently. He saw potential in you today, which is why he risked his own life to spare yours. He sent you to Fabens, because he knows the cartel isn't interested in coming this far outside of El Paso. Rogers furrowed his brow. So what am I supposed to do, run a refugee camp out here? I wish it were that easy, detective. The cartel leader shook his head. If you want to survive, you will need to find a way to be useful to the cartel. Sooner or later, word will get back to those in charge of your existence. When that day comes, it's all of our hope that you will have something of value to offer them. Rogers growled. What the fuck does that even mean? It means the head of the Rivas cartel likes expensive booze and freshly grilled wild game. Francisco replied with a grin. So you and your band of survivors might want to get really good at hunting and scavenging. As long as you're proving yourself useful, there's a good chance you won't order your destruction. Rogers rolled his eyes. Great, I'll get my 70-year-old friend and his 8-year-old grandson acquainted with desert game hunting. Francisco smiled and motioned towards the back SUV. Please, detective, come with me, he said, and led him over to the hood. He waved to the window, and the doors reluctantly opened. Seven twenty-somethings piled out, eyes wide with fear and nervousness. Rodriguez and I anticipated your predicament, so he had me recruit you some help. Francisco explained. They were hiding out in one of the college dorms, so I snuck them out. If they were left in the city, they would be put to work as slaves, or worse for the women. Roger's eyes softened. It's gonna be okay, y'all, he assured the scared youngsters. I'm a police detective, and y'all are safe. Just give me a few minutes, and I'll explain everything. We loaded up what we could and threw it in the trailer. Francisco continued. There's some food water and weapons in there that should help you on your way. When we can, we will send you more people and supplies. But you shouldn't expect them, at least not until we know who we can trust. Rogers nodded. Thank you, Francisco, he said sincerely. And if you would, please take a message back to Rodriguez. Certainly. Tell him. The detective grinned. No hard feelings on the ear. Francisco chuckled and patted his new acquaintance on the shoulder. I'm sure he will be happy to hear that, detective. He went back to his vehicle and opened the door, standing up on the step so he towered over them. Dark days are ahead, detective. I hope that whatever Rodriguez saw in you is the truth. Good luck. He ducked into the vehicle and drove off into the night. Rogers looked around with a touch of bewilderment. 
To one side, he had a group of elderly and children, and to the other, a terrified group of college students. Before he could open his mouth to try to verbally figure out the situation, one of the storefront doors opened, startling him. He drew his gun immediately, swiveling to aim at a scared young man standing in the doorway with his hands high above his head. It's okay, Rogers said, holstering his gun and putting out a hand. You can come out and join us. We're here to help. The young man nodded jerkily and waved over his shoulder. He emerged with a dozen or so people of varying age, slowly moving over to the group. Roger scrubbed his hands down his face and looked around at the expectant and scared faces watching him. He took a deep breath, fighting off the feeling of being overwhelmed with the responsibility that had been placed at his feet. A chuckle bubbled up from his throat, and he shook his head. His presumably deceased captain was likely somewhere in the afterlife, laughing his ass off at Rogers, being thrust into the decision-making role despite decades of avoiding it. All right, everyone, he said, composing himself. My name is Detective Rogers of the El Paso PD. As of this moment, this is our new home. I know you all have been through the ringer over the past few days, but it's not going to get any easier from here on out. Tonight, tonight we eat and we rest. We rejoice in each other's company and be thankful that we are still here. When the sun comes up tomorrow, he squared his shoulders. We begin the fight for our survival. End of Book Five